Hidden beneath the deep blue waves of the Atlantic, clouded in the darkness of the night, acting as a lone wolf stalking its prey, sneaking into port, or strategically lined up along an expected convoy route to intercept any vessel that tries to supply Britain, the U-boat was Germany's premier weapon in their war on Allied shipping in the Battle of the Atlantic. I'm Indy Nidell. This is a World War II in real time special episode on U boat tactics the first two years of the war. The Battle of the Atlantic, and specifically the German U boat campaign to starve the British Isles, is a very dynamic one, characterized by innovations, counter moves, changing tactics, all with varying results. The submarine was already a menace back in the First World War, but then it was more of a novelty though, mostly really usable to block ports or raid shipping in coastal areas. And even after that, the international restrictions put on submarines by the Treaty of Versailles and the London Naval Treaty of 1930, things like the invention of ASDIC, sonar, caused both the British and German admiralties to underestimate the submarine's potential. A potential that is slow to manifest itself as Germany's U-Bootwaffe only has 25 ocean-worthy Type 7 subs at its disposal at the start of World War II. Senior submarine commander Karl Dönitz presses the German high command to prioritize construction of submarines over its surface fleet, claiming that he would only need 300 U-boats to starve Britain into submission. But Kriegsmarine commander Erich Rader is more concerned with cruisers and battleships. Still, in 1939, Dönitz's U-boats managed to sink 106 Allied ships, and the U-boat's potential becomes clear to everyone when Captain Gunther Prien and his U-47 sneak their way into the British naval base at Scapa Flow without being spotted in October 1939 and sink the battleship Royal Oak. Even while still not in great numbers, the U-boats start to raid merchant shipping on the Atlantic. Their deployment is restricted at first, but unrestricted submarine warfare is effectively in place as of August 1940, though American ships are still officially off limits. U-boats usually approach a merchant ship submerged, checking for concealed weapons, torpedoes at the ready. When it is clear that the ship is unarmed, the sub surfaces and inspects the vessel's papers. If the ship carries war-related cargo, it is sunk. This practice becomes more difficult when Britain develops a more effective convoy system. Merchants like tankers and freighters carrying oil, food, and weapons are now increasingly being escorted by a screen of warships. Destroyers, corvettes, minesweepers, whatever they can get their hands on, really. These escorts are often equipped with sonar, which can detect submerged U-boats approaching the convoys, allowing the surface ships to neutralize them with depth charges. However, some early U-boat aces of the Kriegsmarine develop a strategy to deal with sonar. Don't submerge. Captains like Otto Kretschmer use the U-boat's low conning tower, high surface speed, and most importantly, the enemy's focus on looking for submerged submarines. They remain surfaced, slip through the screen of escorts at nighttime, and pick off merchant vessels from the middle of the convoy. While escorts are still looking for the attacker below the waterline, the U-boat can hit multiple targets with its torpedoes and deck gun before slipping out of the convoy, often still unseen. Kretschmer reports his U-boat tactics to headquarters, which include efficient lookouts are of prime importance. Lone ships should be attacked on the surface with gunfire in order to save expensive torpedoes. And once the attack is launched, do not submerge except in circumstances of dire necessity. Remember that on the surface, it is easier for you to spot the enemy than for the enemy to spot you. We have put all 11 points in the pinned comment under this video. Anyhow, this strategy proves quite deadly, like when Convoy HX-72 is sighted by Preen's sub, which together with four other U-boats in the area engaged the convoy, sinking 11 ships totaling 72,700 tons or when 20 out of 35 ships of SC-7 are sunk in October 1940. That year, 492 cargo ships are sunk, totaling roughly 2.37 million tons for the loss of 26 U-boats. The German sailors call this the happy time, the time in which the German U-boat ace is the king of the high seas and the star of the propaganda press back home. 
but all things come to an end. For the happy time, this is the spring of 1941, when new Allied anti-submarine warfare measures seemed to turn the tide in the Battle of the Atlantic. In March 1941, in a span of 10 days, three of Germany's top U-boat aces, Gunter Prien, Joachim Schepke, and Otto Kretschmer, are captured or killed. New technological innovations make the detection of U-boats easier. The increasing availability of surface radar offsets the surface invisibility at night, and a new machine called HFDF, or Huffduff, allows convoys to calculate the bearing and later plot the location of U-boats based on their outgoing and incoming radio traffic. Furthermore, the Destroyers for Bases deal brings the British 50 old American destroyers, which allows for a larger range of cover. Another major blow to the Germans, though they don't know it, is the capture of an Enigma machine in May 1941, allowing the Allies to listen to and eventually decrypt encrypted communications between the U-boats and their headquarters in France. Enigma is the name of the code used. But rather than help to deter or fend off U-boat attacks, these changes really mean that most U-boats can be evaded altogether. See, it's easier for one big convoy to slip through German patrols unseen than it is for 20 lone ships. And if the location of a U-boat is discovered through the deciphering of communications with Enigma, the convoy can just change course to avoid running into the U-boat. Together with the measures that make it much more dangerous for a lone U-boat to attack an escorted convoy, these new developments mean the Germans must find a new group-oriented raiding strategy. Uh, okay, group tactics were already used in 1939, but that was highly uncoordinated, and multiple U-boats might have been ordered to attack the same target by high command without communicating amongst themselves. This is how Kretschmer and his compatriots operated. New tactics of coordinated group attacks are called wolf pack tactics or rudel tactic and were theorized already back in the 1920s. Dernitz particularly likes this and applies it to his vision for the U-Boot Waffe. The idea is for multiple subs to patrol one stretch of sea in a long line at a slow speed with double the visibility range in between the vessels, roughly 10 miles allowing the boats to easily spot and intercept convoys. In practice, poor visibility on the often rough Atlantic allows many ships to slip through. But the increase of the number of U-boats at Dunitz's disposal allows for the improvement of this tactic in what are called fast patrol lines, where multiple lines of 15 or so U-boats patrol a stretch of ocean at a high speed. The use of long-range hydrophones allows the crews to pick up propeller noises of inbound ships. Furthermore, the German Bedienst Naval Intelligence Service has cracked a British naval code allowing them to predict the route of incoming convoys. This has deadly consequences. Like on September 9, 1941, when Slow Convoy 42 is spotted by a sub in a wolf pack. The group infiltrates the convoy and unleashes its torpedoes on the convoy, sinking 16 of 70 ships over three nights. But the glory days of the Wolfpack are still to come. In November 1941, the Kriegsmarine has just over 50 submarines patrolling the seas at one time. In a year, that number will be doubled. We will do another special on U-boat tactics later in the war, as the race of U-boat innovations and countermeasures develops. What is certain, though, is that the Battle of the Atlantic and the ingenuity with which both sides are fighting it will only escalate and the involvement of the United States is already increasing in the fall of 1941. American ships are now escorting Allied convoys as far as Greenland. Should the U.S. actively join the war against Germany, the battle in the Atlantic may go into overdrive. Make sure to check out Kretschmer's 11 points of U-boat warfare in the pinned comment below. And if you'd like to see our episode on the fate of the Bismarck in what might be the most dramatic engagement in the battle of the Atlantic, well, certainly the most hyped engagement in the Battle of the Atlantic. You can click right here for that. Help us make more videos like this one by joining the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. See you next time.